Hi, everyone. I think we're going to get started um, right on time. <laughs> um, so good evening. Uh, my name is Marina McDougall. I'm Vice President Experience and Engagement here at the Academy. And uh, we're delighted to welcome you here tonight for this very special program uh, presented in partnership with Delaware Valley Ornithological Club with special guest Ken Kaufman. Uh, DVOC, founded in 1890, is one of the longest running ornithology organizations in the United States and has been meeting here at the Academy for over 125 years with vibrant conversations, excursions, and important advocacy activity offered throughout the year. year. The Academy deeply values our ongoing partnership with DVOC, and we're excited to be working closely with uh, Naveen and Barb on future collaborations. Many of you might remember that last year during the Academy's Biodiversity Year, we presented two avifauna-related exhibitions, uh, Conversations with Birds, celebrating the role of community science in the observation and stewardship of birds, and Illuminating Birds, Drawing as a Way of Knowing on the Vital Role of Illustration in the Art and Science of Understanding Birds. Tonight's talk, Center of the Bird World, Audubon and His Rivals in Philadelphia, grows out of Ken Kaufman's wonderful new book, The Birds That Audubon Missed, Discovery and Desire in the American Wilderness. It goes to the heart of the colorful history surrounding the practice of or ornithology in its earliest years here in the US, which we evoked in the exhibition, Illuminating Birds. Ken has thoughtfully tailored his talk tonight to discuss the specific cultural and scientific history of our city and region, and, um, and so we're grateful for, for that. Um, it's an honor for the Academy to welcome Ken Kaufman back to the Academy. Ken worked here in the mid-1980s in the ornithology department and continues to have a strong fan base among our staff. Ken is widely celebrated for his sensitive, insightful, and infectious way of inspiring the nascent birder and naturalist in all of us. I include myself as one of those people. Um, before we start, I wanted to extend a special thanks to Molly Gross, the Academy's Public Programs Manager, for her excellent work organizing tonight's program, as well as Frank Gallup is in the booth, and um, Liam o O'Donnell, who at the end will help facilitate your questions. So uh, next, Barb is going to share a little bit more about DVOC. And while she comes up to the stage, I want to welcome all of our participants who are joining online tonight. Thank you, Marina. Well, welcome, everyone. And uh, we are just thrilled with this continuing partnership that we have with the Academy of Natural Sciences. Welcome, everyone in the room. Welcome. Uh, to Ken and to everyone on Zoom as well. Uh, check out our website, dvoc.org. It's a whole lot easier to say that than Delaware Valley Ornithological Club. So um, check it out. We have uh, programs. Our programs are hybrid like this one. So you can join us uh, online or we'd love for you to come down to the bees classroom here at the Academy and, and join us in person. Um, we also do an informal dinner ahead of time at the Asia on the Parkway, and then our famous Cherry Street afterwards. So it's a lot of fun. Check it out. In addition to our meetings, we also do a variety of walks out there. And um, in Philadelphia, it's under the Bird, um, Bird Philly logo, which I forgot to bring down. But anyhow, so... <laughs> So within Philadelphia, we are branded under the Bird Philly logo, and, but we also do walks all over uh, the Delaware Valley uh, region. They're, they're free to everyone. And um, so check us out. If you want some information, um, we have cards down here, so it'll point you right to our website. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Naveen because um, as you go through the DVOC, you start off as secretary, vice president, then president, vice presidents. I swear, they do all the work. They got to set up all the speakers. <laughs> Hi, everybody. 
Thank you all so much for coming tonight and everybody on Zoom as well. I'm Naveen Sheshikumar, Vice President and Programs Chair of the DVOC. And it's my privilege today to introduce Ken Kaufman, our speaker. When I first started birding nine or 10 years ago now, I picked up Ken's Kingbird Highway. This is the story of a 16-year-old kid who hitchhiked, hitchhiked his way across the US and Canada to, in his quest to see as many birds as possible. 16-year-old hitch hitchhiking all across the US. Um, I read it, I was hooked, was absolutely nuts. So I, I looked for other books by Ken and he's written a lot of them. Many, some of them are field guides um, and not all of them are just about birds. I have, I have his books on butterflies and insects. Um, so, so when Ken and I first started talking about doing this program back in January this year, I was thrilled to know that he had a new book coming out, The Birds That Audubon Missed. Um, so exactly 200 years ago, three bird men met right here in Philadelphia, I think at the Academy. And uh, one of them, of course, was Audubon, title of the book. Uh, the other was vice president of the Academy at the time, George Ard. And the third was Charles Bonaparte, his nephew of Napoleon. Today, Ken will talk about the interactions between these men and other notable ontologists in the area and how these encounters would change the course of bird study in the US and across the world. In addition, sorry, um, Ken's book is also about the birds that Audubon did not see or notice for various reasons, which I think you'll cover today. Uh, and Ken is an accomplished artist himself, and he's painted some of these birds in the style of Audubon. Hopefully he'll show some of them to us tonight. I think he should because I, I absolutely love them. In addition, Ken is also the field editor of the National Audubon Society, fellow of the American Ornithological Society, and the only person to have won American Birding Association's Lifetime Achievement Award twice. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Kaufman. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Naveen and Barb and Marina. I'm, I'm so honored to, to be here, um, to be back at the Academy. Uh, this, um, uh, as Marina mentioned, this, this program is tailored specifically to this place, so this is the only time I'll be giving the program. So I'm especially grateful to those of you who are here or are tuning in online. Uh, this, um, I, I love to talk about birds. I have to rein myself in so I don't just go on and on. But um, this is such a pleasure for me to, to get to be here. Uh, when I say uh, Philadelphia is the center of the bird world, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a carefully considered phrase. And uh, you know it might not be that way every year, but certainly if you look at the history, uh, Philadelphia really looms large. Of course, in United States history, we all know that Philadelphia was incredibly important um, and continues to be. But that also uh, holds for, uh, for the history of bird study. Now that's the, the book that just came out, The Birds That Audubon Missed. That's not a complete description of what the book is about. You know, uh, a book's title doesn't necessarily describe the whole contents. Um, when John Steinbeck wrote The Grapes of Wrath, it was not about grapes. Um, but it just seemed like a, a catchy title. And so it's all about um, early history, uh, especially the early 1800s uh, of ornithology in Eastern North America. But looking at that time period, Philadelphia emerges as an incredibly important uh, center for that study. And one thing that reflects that is the fact that there's no other city in the world that's commemorated in the names of so many birds. I mean, there are, there are birds named for countries like the Canada goose or for states like the California condor, but Philadelphia actually has its own personalized birds. The morning warbler is Geothlipus philadelphia. The Bonaparte skull is Crococephalus philadelphia. And you can't miss the Philadelphia vireo, vireo philadelphicus, says it twice just to make sure you, you get that. But in fact, people did miss it 
uh, this bird, um, even though this was the center of bird study and there were so many talented naturalists in the area, the Philadelphia vireo wasn't detected until the 1840s and wasn't described to science until 1851. And if you want to know why that happened, you'll have to read the book. But when I talk about um, a bird being known to science or being officially named, um, that, that has a specific meaning here. I'm just, uh, in this talk and in the book, I'm just talking about uh, what happened within the uh, framework of European um, or Western or Linnaean science. Obviously, uh, there are indigenous peoples in this area who were thoroughly familiar with all the wildlife, with all the plants. There is a deep knowledge of natural history um, that goes back thousands of years. But at this, in this stage, I'm just talking about uh, the system of scientific names that was introduced by Linnaeus, uh, a Swedish naturalist in the 1750s. And that's the one we use today worldwide when a bird or any species of living thing has a two-word name in Latin or something close to Latin. Uh, that's following the Linnaean system. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I won't dwell on it, uh, but we, we have to uh, just, just remember that when we're talking about discovery. Uh, in a lot of these cases, these were birds that had been known for a long time and were being rediscovered. And I think looking at it that way, uh, just makes it seem more three-dimensional for us. We're jumping into a long-standing tradition and adding to it. Now, um, e even if we look at this, this narrow definition, it's still such a broad subject that we can't cover all of it. Uh, I've been told that we have to be out of here before uh, July. So, um, so I'm just going to focus on what was happening about 200 years ago here um, around uh, 1824. That seems like a really long time ago, but in fact, the uh, impact of Philadelphia on bird study can be traced back at least 75 years before that uh, to the 1750s, uh, going back to this, this legendary teenage birder, uh, William Bartram. Well, he, he wasn't a teenager when this portrait was painted. I mean, this was painted around you know, 1808 when he was getting close to 70 years old. But earlier he had been like the hottest teenage birder in North America. And uh, he had a great place to practice his study of birds. Uh, his father, John Bartram, had established Bartram's garden and was doing this amazing work with horticulture and with describing uh, new plant species. and. Bartram was sending specimens and cuttings over to England and to Europe and corresponding with all the top scientists on the other side of the Atlantic. And a lot of the, um, the plants that John Bartram sent over turned out to be new to science. And young William Bartram, uh, who was a teenager in the 1750s, he was interested in plants too, but you get the sense that there is a sense of uh, like competition or something. It's like, you know, if dad can find these new plants, I bet I can find some new birds in this area. Um, at that time, there were no bird experts in North America that he could send specimens or notes to. So he connected with a, one of the top experts in England, uh, George Edwards. Um, all those English guys had really good hair in those days. Um, but, um, George Edwards was really a sharp guy, a good naturalist, and a really decent person, too. He published a number of books. This was one of the volumes of his Gleanings of Natural History, which had like, pictures and, of birds, plants, insects, and things from just scattered points all over the world. So he was thrilled to get these specimens from young William Bartram in, in Philadelphia. And he, uh, he wound up uh, publishing about uh, many of them. This, uh, the blue gray gnat catcher, uh, some of us saw some just on the south edge of the city this morning. Uh, the, for Edwards, this was the little blue gray flight catcher. And uh, William Bartram had sent him specimens of the adults and of the nest. And you don't want to look too closely at that picture and at the scale. It looks like there's, a, you know, that nest is like 40 feet tall. And uh, you know, gnat catchers are really smaller than that. But, um, 
in his text, when Edwards was writing about this, he gave full credit to William Bartram. Same thing when he was talking about, he wrote about the white-throated sparrow, golden-winged warbler, and various other things. And he always, in every case, he credited uh, William Bartram. And that, that's really admirable because frequently scientists don't get around to giving credit to people who help them, especially if they're you know, young foreigners. Um, but that, uh, you know, Ed, um, Edwards was, was good about that. Uh, one of the birds um, that he illustrated was the worm-eating warbler. And until I was working on this book, I didn't know why we called it worm-eating warbler. I mean, they don't eat earthworms, you know. Um, but Bartram uh, had found one uh, down at Bartram's garden in July, uh, which is sort of an odd time of year. It's not that common around here. But he sent the specimen over, and Edwards was examining it and trying to figure it out. And he illustrated it here, the, uh, the worm eater and the goat beetle. And um, uh, Edwards wrote, uh, the bird seems to be of a kind between the slender-billed birds and the thick-billed granivorous tribe. Um, this worm eater I received from Mr. William Bartram, who says that it is a bird of passage and that he has observed all the slender-billed birds of Pennsylvania to be so. In other words, you know, the idea of warblers hadn't been defined at that point yet, but uh, this kid, um, William Bartram, had figured out that these the warbler things, the ones with thin bills, were just migratory in the area. And you think about the fact that he didn't have binoculars or field guides or anything, and that's really pretty impressive. But George Edwards decided that because this bird had sort of an intermediate uh, thickness of bill. It must be something that ate worms. And uh, so uh, when this bird was finally uh, given a scientific name in 1789, it was based on this publication by Edwards. And, and we've called it the, the worm-eating warbler uh, ever since. Now, in later years, uh, William Bartram focused more on plants than on birds, but he continued to be one of the top bird experts in North America into the early 1800s. So there were other bird experts like, like Thomas Jefferson. Um, and one really amazing character, uh, Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, Peel painted the self-portrait of himself in later years, uh, the artist in his museum. And if you look back behind him there, there are these wooden cases, 140 wooden cases with specimens of birds, all of them carefully labeled with names and numbers and so on. And it was like a, a complete American ornithology. And if Peel had succeeded in publishing his work, we would be looking back now and saying, oh, he was, he was the founder uh, of ornithology in, in North America. Uh, Charles Wilson Peel hasn't gotten the credit that he deserves uh, but he's about to because Matthew Halley, <laughs> Matthew Halley has been researching uh, Peel's work and has, has all these unpublished notes that are being published now. Uh, the website, uh, Ornithology in Peel's Museum, uh, the database is already accessible. The whole website will be available soon and it will reveal that all these birds that were described by other people later were already known. They were already in Peel's Museum. And that's going to change our whole view. So uh, our knowledge of history keeps developing in these ways. And it, to me, it's just really exciting. Uh, but you know, at the time, um, since he didn't get it published, uh, most people look back now and they think that, well, the, the founders um, were first uh, Alexander Wilson, who wrote his uh, American Ornithology around 1810, and then John James Audubon, who came along and published a bigger work in the 1820s and 1830s and made uh, the birds more, more popular uh, and better, you know, much better known. At that time, um, most of the easy birds in eastern North America had been found already. Something like the red-headed woodpecker had been described to science uh, before Wilson or Audubon were even born. And so uh, when these guys were wandering around uh, the eastern part of the continent looking for new birds, there weren't that many easy ones left. Uh, they really had to work on it. So when Alexander Wilson uh, brought out the first volume of his ornithology in 1808, a lot of it was compilation of what had already been learned, what had already been published in Europe, 
or what was already in Peel's museum. He did find some new birds, uh, but he, more importantly, he compiled information that was much more accurate uh, than what had been published before. Wilson didn't really get into birds until about 1803, but by 1808, he was correcting all these errors that had been made by, by European uh, authors writing about them and just you know, very boldly saying, well, uh, these people were all wrong and this is the, these are the actual facts. Uh, uh, he, he was a good, he was a careful scientist. And you know, for example, the fish crow, which you can find along the rivers here uh, around Philadelphia, uh, Wilson was the first to figure out that, okay, near water, uh, near the coast or along major rivers, there are these smaller crows with a slightly different voice. And he saw them in a number of places before he was willing to, uh, to write about them. Uh, of course, he did, um, he did make some mistakes. Uh, Wilson, he was correct when he had uh, uh, described the bay-breasted warbler in, in 1810. William Bartram had seen it and called it the little chocolate-breasted titmouse, which I think is a great name. You know, you can you can spring that on people on on bird walks. Um, the, but um, he, so he had that one worked out. But like the next year, he illustrated and described a bird that he called the autumnal warbler. It was center right on this this plate here. He was baffled by the autumnal warbler because he wrote that. In October, he could go out and find a hundred of these in a day as they were passing through, but in spring, they were just impossible to find. But what he was seeing was, uh, he was seeing what we call confusing fall warblers, seeing bay-breasted warbler and black pole warbler in their fall plumage when they're uh, very similar to each other and very different from what they look like in spring. And so yeah, here's all these hundreds of autumnal warblers and what do they do in spring? But it was an honest mistake. It was, um, you know, something that he probably would have figured out. If you read through Wilson's Ornithology, uh, the first seven volumes, uh, he keeps correcting his own mistakes. He'll write about something in volume four, and then in volume five, he'll correct that and say, okay, well, I was wrong. You know, completely unconcerned about, you know, admitting error. He just wanted to get the facts out there. But... Um, uh, Wilson didn't live long enough to complete his first edition of his American Ornithology. He, uh, he essentially worked himself to death and died in, in August of 1813. But uh, fortunately for his work, uh, he had attracted the attention of this guy named George Ord, who was a successful businessman and beginning birder uh, in Philadelphia. And Ord became you know, kind of a groupie you're following Wilson around. He wasn't supporting him financially, which at first, which would have been really helpful, but he was like collecting specimens, just which, which Wilson didn't necessarily need, but just wanted to be involved. But um, as Wilson is dying in August of 1813, he names George Ord as one of the executors of his will. And Ord takes this seriously and arranges to have the eighth and ninth volumes of American Ornithology finished and published. And he goes on to become a really, a really good scientist. Um, for example, I mean, he, uh, he described the uh, ring-billed gull to science, named it for the Delaware River, Laris delawareensis. And, you know, the, you know, birders today sometimes have trouble with gulls. The early ornithologists did too, to figuring them out. Admittedly, this bird was harder to find then because you couldn't just go to the parking lot of McDonald's to, to find the ring-billed gull. But, um, but he, did, uh, he did really good work. And the, uh, the perception of Ord has been kind of negative because apparently he had um, you know, kind of an unpleasant personality and he didn't like children. So, and he criticized other people. And so um, he's maybe not remembered in a positive way, but he did... Um, did really good work. Um, and importantly, he was active uh, in the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, when it was um, shortly after it was founded. He wasn't one of the founding members, uh, but he, uh, he joined uh, shortly thereafter. He was elected to membership in the Academy uh, and soon became the vice president and he was active 
in the academy for many years. The academy was an organization at first, not like a place. It wasn't a physical spot, but it was an organization of people interested in nature. And it very quickly became established as the leading organization for nature studies in the Americas. Um, and as such, uh, it attracted uh, the attention of, of other naturalists. Um, for example, uh, Charles Lucien Bonaparte. Uh, he, um, this, you know, we don't have pictures of most of these people when they were young. He, you know, he was in his 40s at this point. Uh, but in 1824, he was just 20 years old, and he had just arrived from Europe. And uh, un unlike Wilson and Audubon, he arrived in North America knowing a lot about birds. He'd had a very good education. Uh, he'd been raised in privilege, and he'd had a chance to meet scientists and go to museums. So Bonaparte uh, arrives, he's 20 years old, he quickly gets elected to membership in the Academy of Natural Sciences. Now, part of the reason he'd been, um, had a privileged childhood was because uh, Napoleon was his uncle. And uh, Napoleon wasn't that much of a birder. If he had been, um, <laughs> if he had been a birder, just think of all the species he could have seen traveling around Europe, all those uh, campaigns he could have, you know, set up his military campaigns at the right time of year to catch migration. But, you know, he, uh, he missed out. But, but Charles Bonaparte um, arrived already knowing a lot about birds, and he went on to do great work for a few decades thereafter. Uh, because he spent time in Philadelphia, he wound up with great knowledge of the birds of both North America and Europe. And he published about them. This was one of his works from 1838, a uh, comparative list of the birds of Europe and North America with, with really good data. I mean, over here, there, there are columns for European and American birds. And he's comparing like the kites, comparing a black-shouldered kite to white-tailed kite. And here are the falcons down below and pointing out the uh, jeer falcons and peregrines and merlins are uh, on both continents. Although at the time he was separating them into different species, he knew those were allied. So, so really great work and, and one of the great ornithologists of the 1800s. But unfortunately, uh, when he was first arriving, uh, when he first arrived in Philadelphia, he was elected to membership in the academy, but then he got onto the bad side of George Ord, which apparently was an easy thing to do. Uh, partly he presented a paper where he discussed the uh, names of birds used in Wilson's ornithology. And Ord was not pleased that this French guy was coming in and criticizing the great Wilson. And then a short while later, um, uh, Ord referred to him as Mr. Bonaparte. And Bonaparte, he was from a royal family. You know, at that point in the family hierarchy, he was a count and not a prince, but the Americans didn't know that. And he wasn't willing to be just called Mr. Bonaparte. So they, they were clashing and there was friction between them. But that was eclipsed pretty quickly in April of 1824 when Audubon arrived in town. Now, when, um, when birders today think about ornithology in the early 1800s, if they do at all, um, you know, we tend to think about Audubon first and last. He did these, these magnificent uh, bird portraits and, uh, and he had this, these huge bird portraits. He had an outrageous personality. So he sort of takes, a, you know, takes all the oxygen out of the room. Um, and you know, there, really, um, there were other great ornithologists at the time. But for, you know, ever since he passed away in 1851, for at least a century thereafter, he was regarded as this great hero uh, as the greatest naturalist in America. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's true that he accomplished a lot, but you know, people have, they were aware that there were some things in his writings that didn't quite add up, but people were willing to just ignore that and push it aside. And um, it's people who are writing histories and biographies didn't know enough about birds to really uh, question uh, his scientific claims. And more recently, we're starting to get a more complete picture uh, of how Audubon stacks up as a scientist. And there's an interesting illustration that involves Wilson and Audubon and the black-throated blue warbler. 
Now this is the black-throated blue warbler. You've got the, the female on the left, the male on the right, and obviously they look very different. And Wilson had figured out the male black-throated blue warbler, but the female, when he encountered that, he decided it was a new species, and he named it the pine swamp warbler. You know, an easy mistake to make. For at least 20 years after that, nobody questioned uh, his designation of the, the pine swamp warbler. But Audubon's reaction to it was interesting. Um, he, uh, Audubon claimed that he had gone to the same spot. Um, Matthew Halley has, has found evidence that he actually, he was in the wrong place. He didn't go to the right place. But So Audubon goes there, and not only does he find the, the pine swamp warbler, he finds a lot of them. He finds more of them than Wilson did. Uh, Audubon claimed that he found a pair of pine swamp warblers with their nest in August. And, you know, female black-throated blue warblers, they don't pair up and build nests. And the species is not nesting as late as August. So, you know, Audubon just made up the whole thing. But, you know, he just had to, he had to outdo Wilson. It's like, okay, you know, um, I, I, I found more of them. And there, you know, there are other things once you start looking into it. Um, you know, his bird of Washington, the largest eagle in North America, was, you know, it was a fabrication. Uh, his carbonated warbler was probably, probably a fabricated warbler. Um, and even with things that were real, like, uh, you know, Harris's hawk, we know it exists, but uh, there's, there's reason to believe that Audubon stole the specimen so that he could name it for his friend Harris. And he stole it from the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia. So you have a local, a local connection. Um, but so that's the, so the setup uh, for 1824. At that point, uh, 10 years have passed since Wilson died and Ord completed his American Ornithology. Ord is now in 1824 working on a new edition uh, he's going to reissue all those volumes with some uh, revisions and additions to them. Bonaparte is already working on what's going to be a supplement. He's going to do four volumes of supplementary information to, to Wilson. And now here comes Audubon coming back from the frontier with his own ideas about doing a, a thing on the birds of America. You know, Audubon had been a shopkeeper and mill owner out in Kentucky. Uh, he'd gone bankrupt with the financial crash of 1819. He'd gone off to Louisiana, he'd been painting birds. He came back and he had all these big paintings and, uh, and he really wanted to get them, uh, get them published. So um, uh, here's, here's Audubon in the, in the 1820s with his favorite uh, birding equipment. Um, but you know, back from the frontier, and here he comes, you know, striding into these, these hallowed halls of Philadelphia. And um, so uh, he really wanted to be accepted by the scientific community here, and he wanted to find an engraver who could do the engraving of his work so it could be printed and, and published here. And he, uh, he ran into problems. Um, he met Charles Bonaparte pretty quickly, and the two of them hit it off well, even though you had this short, handsome prince who was about 20 years old, and Audubon was this, this tall 40-year-old uh, backwoodsman. But they, they got along well because they were both so interested in birds. So Bonaparte takes Audubon to a meeting of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And a lot of the people there liked his drawings, his paintings, but George Ord was not so thrilled. And they, a number of things happened that uh, sort of set them against each other. And Ord would be a, a serious critic of Audubon for the rest of his life. And uh, he also failed to find an engraver at that point. Bonaparte took him to meet Lawson, Alexander Lawson, who had done all the engrave, engravings for Alexander Wilson, and who is now at that point starting to do stuff for Bonaparte as well. But Alexander Lawson looks at these Audubon paintings and says, these things aren't accurate, they aren't good, they, they're not suitable for engraving. And so he, uh, he essentially failed in everything he was trying to do there. Um, he was rejected in Philadelphia 
1824, and it seems to have had a serious impact on him. And in fact, it did. As a final sort of desperate last ditch effort, Audubon goes to England, arriving in July of 1826. And there, improbably, he has like instant success. You know, the, the British are just thrilled by this guy. You know, he comes, he's like straight out of a novel by James Fenimore Cooper, you know, he's uh, the Deerslayer or something. He's got these big paintings. They don't know enough there to question his scientific claims. So within a few months after arriving in England, um, Audubon is being treated like a celebrity and he's found an engraver. Robert Havel Jr. in London was probably one of the best engravers in the world at that time. He could handle really subtle gradations of color in a way that Lawson back in Philadelphia couldn't. And so uh, Audubon becomes this big international star. And after his big success in England, he's able to go back to America and be greeted as a returning hero there. I think if Audubon had gotten his stuff published um, in North America, in Philadelphia, he would have been you know, remembered as an artist, but I don't think he would have been anywhere near the celebrity status that he achieved. So really an interesting time. Um, in researching this book, my views on all of these characters shifted um, quite a bit. Uh, all of these historical characters who were connected to Philadelphia. It turns out uh, William Bartram and Charles Wilson Peale, and Alexander Wilson, George Ord, Charles Bonaparte, they were all more impressive than I had originally thought. Um, Ord and Bonaparte and Audubon were all seriously impacted by their interactions with the Academy of Natural Sciences. Audubon himself turns out to be um, problematic. Um, not as good a scientist as we might have hoped, but an amazing artist. And I know that Audubon is an amazing artist because I tried, uh, I tried to imitate his work. I tried to imagine how Audubon would have painted some of these birds that he never saw, and I, I really came up short. This is the only one of my paintings that I'm including uh, in this talk. There are some others reproduced in the book. I just, my, my best paintings were not as good as Audubon's worst. So my respect for Audubon as an artist has just increased and increased. I mean, he's, this is the real deal. Just one of the most amazing bird artists in history. So finally, you know, looking back, one thread that bound all of these individuals together was their passion for birds and their excitement about the idea of discovery. Uh, just discovery was something that, that ran through their, uh, all of their careers. This was one of Audubon's new discoveries. Um, he called it Selby's Flycatcher. He was actually a young hooded warbler, so it wasn't anything new, but he thought it was at the time. Uh, he thought it was something new. This was one of my discoveries when I was seven years old. I, I found this bird that this sounded like a cat. I named it the cat bird. And in fact, you know, we still call it that. Um, I, I, I wasn't the first to discover it, but it was still a genuine discovery that thrilled me at the time. And now, you know, it's been a while since I was seven years old, but, you know, decades later, I'm still so excited when I discover something new. Watching the robins nesting near my house in Ohio, every year I learn or discover something new about their behavior. And I think, you know, all of us who are interested in birds, we are just so blessed because we never run out of new things to discover. We never run out of novelty. And any day we go out, now, we may not find a bird that's new to science, but we're going to see something that's amazing and we're going to be blessed by just extraordinary things. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention. I hope you all are blessed with discoveries every day for the rest of your lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. That was an amazing talk. I would now like to invite Jason Rexstein, the Associate Curator of Ornithology and Associate Professor 
here at the Academy for a moderate discussion with, with Ken. It was a great talk, Ken. I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed your book. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I, I mean, you've, you've got uh, scientific credentials um, far beyond anything I could ever achieve. So if you enjoyed the book, then that's, uh, that, that means a lot to me. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, we, we talked a little bit about was how, you know, exploration is still happening. And, um, and there's so many exciting things. Like we, we were emailing back and forth you know, before Ken came and, um, you know, we were emailing about interesting discoveries that, you know, just came out, you know, that we just found out in, you know, in new journals that have come out in, in the recent past, um, you know, all kinds of things. Like um, one of the things that we talked about was the giant hummingbirds. Um, I think probably a lot of you know about giant hummingbirds and um, the largest hummingbird species in the world. And we've all thought that there was just one giant hummingbird species in the world. And a, a graduate student at University of New Mexico, Jesse Williamson, was working on these things for her dissertation and was putting geolocators on birds in Chile. And these are migrant populations of giant hummingbirds. And it turns out they migrate to Peru. And it turns out that the resident birds are totally genetically different than these migrant birds. So something that, you know, in, in museum drawers, we didn't realize these things were different. There, there are really different things in those drawers. So, you know, there's lots of stuff to discover out there. Yeah, I mean, just the idea. I mean, giant hummingbird is one of those, you know, contradictory names like jumbo shrimp, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've seen giant hummingbirds in Peru, but two species? You know, now we have to go back. And, yeah, now and I don't know what again. I've seen. I, yeah. I'm not sure what's on my list yet. I have to sort of suss it out, but. Right, and that, that's just like one example of the kinds of things that have been coming out. Yeah, um, you know, one of the other one of the other examples that we talked about was um, viries, for example, a common thrush that we have that nests here in Philadelphia and migrates through here. Um, a recent paper came out showing that there is genetic structure in viries, that there are populations in the Appalachians, populations in eastern North America and in the West that are genetically different. So there are potentially three different things. Whether those are species or not is debatable, but it's still you know, it's still showing us that there's, you know, there are different things out there that, that we didn't know about. Yeah, that, that's, that's so great that it's the Viri too, because uh, that, that, that's a, a bird that our friend uh, Matthew Halley has studied uh, as one of his studies. But, yep. but yeah, so there may be multiple Viri's. Um, you'll have to triple all your studies, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a splitter and I doubt. <laughs> But there are, you know, so many, so many other things. And, you know, being at the academy, um, you see a lot of this stuff. Um, you see evidence of it coming in and just dealing with your other colleagues. Yeah, uh, we have lots of people visiting using the collections that are making big discoveries. We make them ourselves. And, you know, I think one of the exciting things is there are still places on the planet that we, we don't know what birds are in those places. Um, we visit places in Amazonia, for example, where... You know, we know that one species is in one place, another one's in another place. Where do they meet up? We don't know. They're, 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 you know, they're sort of these unknown black box places still on our planet to explore. Yeah, so, so still uh, great discoveries to be made. And yep. I mean, you know, there's, there's the personal level of discovery, but it is still possible to go out and find things that, that nobody knows. Yeah. And I think the other piece of this is that, you know, we have tools that, these folks didn't have. You know, we can we can sequence the genomes of birds. We can put geolocators on birds. We also have amazing optics and binoculars and cameras. I mean, it, it's it's kind of amazing that they even found the things that they did. Um, you know, I don't I don't know how they do that without having binoculars. You know, like we have now. So, I think those tools allow us to to see things and detect things and study things in ways that were, you know, not even imaginable. Yeah, and, and the use of things like genetics uh, or looking at the genomes, that, that continues to develop, doesn't it? It's... Yep, it continues to develop. I mean, when I was a graduate student, we'd, we'd have to sit in the lab and work for, you know, years to, you know, gather a thousand base pairs, a thousand letters of, of DNA sequence for an individual bird. And now we can sequence whole genomes in a, a fraction of the time. Um, so, like, the students that work in my lab are doing things that are just, you know, 
beyond what I could have imagined as a graduate student. And that's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. The, the frontier is still out there. Exactly. Yeah. And are, are there cases where field observers uh, were just, just observations by people out in the field are leading to some of these? Uh... I think there, you know, there are lots of exciting things. I mean, you know, uh, a close friend of many of ours, um, Tom Johnson, was using a thermal scope to study birds at Cape May and watch them migrate. You know, he was seeing things like ruddy ducks fly over Cape May. I mean, who's seen a ruddy duck in the room fly before? Ruddy Major ducks Man. can fly? Yeah. What? Yeah, what? exactly. I mean, I've never seen a ruddy duck fly. Yeah. Um, Tom had photos that he took of ruddy ducks flying at night and, he did, you know, and, and lots of other things. So I think there's a lot of room. I think that's in a way why ornithology is such an advanced field because we have so many, you know, we have, we have formal scientists and we have amateurs and there's sort of a gray area. I mean, I'm a birder and a scientist, I do both. And I love, you know, I love my local birding, you know, bird listing at my local park and, you know, learning what's common and rare there. And I also love, you know, studying phylogenetics and evolutionary history of birds. So. Yeah, I, I think you probably could say that the, like the early ornithologists that I was talking about, I mean, they were, they were amateurs. They didn't have degrees in ornithology because there was no such thing. Exactly, yeah, that was, that was the tradition back in yeah. the day, sort of the gentleman naturalists. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, now, you know, I think in a way, because we don't have that gentleman naturalist anymore, we have you know, such a diverse set of people birding now, we, you know, we sort of benefit from that. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a sport jacket now, but that doesn't mean that I'm a gentleman, you know. I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've got tennis shoes and jeans on, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, I, that that's one of the things that's really exciting to me is that bird study is opening up to everyone. It's not at one time it was mostly the wealthy, like you know, George Edwards could sit there in England analyzing. Uh, bird specimens because he was wealthy, but now it's something that's, that's opened up that everyone can get involved. Yeah, yeah, binoculars have gotten cheaper and better and, mm -hmm. you know, cameras. I mean, it, it, it's mind boggling. You can, you can document things with your cell phone. Sometimes on my way to work, I go through a little, a little square down the road from here and, you know, in January I've documented oven birds with my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, Something that Wilson never dreamed of. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was only one way to document back then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, should we take questions? What's the... Uh, sure. Uh... Thank you, yeah. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience, and just let me know. I have, I have a quick question to start off with. Ken, in your book, I was particularly touched by the chapter Abundant Life, in it you talk about trees teeming with red-headed woodpeckers. And I think you mentioned this in account of 48,000 golden plovers shot at one location on a single day. Uh, so it's, it's kind of poignant, but towards the end of the book and it's part of what your discussion today, you talk about new discoveries. And we, earlier this morning, we talked about limpkins spreading out from where they were only in Florida to many states all across the US now. Um, it, do you do you feel jealous of not being able to see such abundant life, or is some of that offset by some of these new discoveries and range expansions and things like that? Hmm, well, well, thanks, Naveen. That's um, yeah. I I sort of decided late in the process of writing the book to add this chapter that I called "Abundant Life." Just uh, it's so hard, you know. Even today, it's hard to get a sense of exactly how many birds there are. It's the total populations. And it's even much harder to fi try to figure out what their populations were 200 years ago. But just reading these accounts by people like Wilson and Audubon, Thomas Nuttall and others, you get the sense that some of these birds were vastly more numerous there at, at that time with, you know, 100 red-headed woodpeckers, uh, you know, being, being shot out of the same tree in the same day and things like that. Gee, I wonder what happened to them. Um, the yeah, you get the sense that birds may have been much more abundant, but we don't really know that. They may have varied with with species, and now you have some things. You know, certainly bird populations have declined, but some birds are increasing, um, like like the limpkins we were talking about, uh, like bald eagles that have increased in the last few decades. 
Um, and I, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm envious of those who got to see this continent uh, 200 years ago, but I think we also have to celebrate the, the abundance that we, that we still have. Thank you. Questions? Microphone. Oh boy, this is very formal. I just wanted to comment on the word that we, uh, that you used earlier, amateur. And amateur, well, it, it carries a connotation of being a dilettante, you know, you don't have very deep knowledge. Amateur means lover. So amateurs do what they do because they love it, not because they're getting paid for it, but out of love for the subject matter. Excellent point. Yeah. <laughs> um, a great talk, Ken. Thanks. Um, so, when you look back at that history, let's say Wilson found a bird, shot it, described it. What did it take in those days for it to be established as a new bird? Did did others have to then go out and validate this? Was there a process in place? Were they actually trying to do science, or it was truly you know, sort of the Wild West, if you will, at that time? Well, yeah, the, I mean, different individuals differed in just how scientific they were in their approach. But someone like Wilson, if he had a bird that he thought was new, he would look at what was published, you know, to the extent that he could find it. You know, he would go through William Bartram's library and things like that. And, decide that, okay, this appears to be something new. But um, for a long time, you know, the things did not proceed smoothly because some of these birds were described and named over and over by different people. And it was really not until like the, uh, the late 1800s that things were, were worked out when the, uh, the American Ornithologist Union was established in the 1880s and the, the leading uh, taxonomists at the time would decide, okay, well, these, these five birds are all the same thing, and this was the first name published, so it has priority. But that, you know, it was, it was a very long, long process, and many, many, many bird names were proposed that turned out not to be valid. So, yeah, it was the Wild West. <laughs> Ken, if you and your wife were able to host a dinner party and you could choose any four American ornithological personalities in history, going back to Gates being even going up to Cassett, who would you invite? What four would you invite? And how would you start the conversation? <laughs> wow, that is a great question. I don't know if I can come up with a great answer, but... Um, there were so many uh, fascinating uh, characters. Um, I think um, uh, Florence Merriam Bailey, I would want to invite her because she, uh, she had to break down so many barriers to become a successful um, ornithologist in the, in the late 1800s. Uh, uh, Pierre Viello, whose name I'm probably not pronouncing correctly, a uh, French guy who did some really amazing work, but there's relatively little known about him. We don't know much about his life. He was like, for example, he was the first to figure out that vireos were different from shrikes or flight catchers, things like that. Um, oh, this is tough. Oh, would you have any nominations? You can invite a couple. <laughs> There are people that are even more recent in time that I, you know, I would love to meet Ted Parker. You know, I know that's something you knew that, you know, was kind of, you know, a hero of mine in a way. Um, you know, and, and you know, I'm fortunate to know people that knew him. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, there, there are a lot of Amazonian explorers that I would have loved to have kind of interviewed. Mm -hmm. And how would you start the conversation? Uh, I'd probably say, uh, can you please pass the ketchup? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I'd probably um, just, I, it would be so great to hear the different perspectives of the, these different, uh, different naturalists and different ornithologists and, and hear about their, 
their lives and their experiences. Um, you know, maybe start with a question like, you know, what was your most exciting discovery ever? And let it go from there. Uh, lovely talk, thank you. It was surprising to me to uh, see that Peel had such a, an extraordinary collection. So I have two questions. One, do we know what happened to it? And two, in terms of protecting collections with all their little data sheets, I wonder what uh, the Academy is doing to make sure that they don't have anything happen like what happened in England when they had the feather, the feather thief and they tore, they stole all the birds and then they tore all their tags off and all the information was disassociated with the specimens. Um, so the, the, I guess I can answer the feather thief sort of question. So first of all, we lock all of our cases. Um, you know, it's, we're also behind closed doors so you have to swipe in to get upstairs. The British Museum thing was a, He actually came in and sucked the place out before he stole all the specimens. And they didn't really know who he was. Um, you know, I think, yeah, we have better security, I think, than, than, than that. Um, the reality is specimens have probably been stolen from almost every collection out there in one way or another. Um, I can tell a quick story, and that is that a friend called me up, um, a colleague of mine called me up, this is, this is years ago already, and said, one of your specimens from the Academy of Natural Sciences is being sold on eBay. <laughs> um, and it, it turned out it was a specimen that we had long ago traded and given away to another institution, but it was stolen from that institution. We bought it back, somebody bought it back for us. So we have that specimen, but there was a person basically stealing specimens from another collection here in the United States, um, a small collection at a university where there was no lock on the door, no lock on the cases, and nobody was caring for the collection. So that's a huge part of it, is having a place that's funded, where we have scientists, we have people working in it, we have you know collections assistants from collections managers and graduate students. If there are people working there and it's active, that's not likely to happen. You may be better, better at um, doing that, or... Yeah. Yeah, uh, my impression is that we don't know what happened to most of those specimens, but uh, the world's expert on the Peel collection is in the room. And Matt, I don't know if you'd be willing to respond. I could say just a couple of things. Um, so like Ken mentioned, uh, I just released a database called Ornithology in Peel's Museum. Uh, over the last five or six years, I've traced primary sources for 625 species of birds in Peel's Museum. Uh, in, uh, all, and probably 90% of these sources are unpublished. Uh, so when Peel died, his children uh, weren't so good with money. And the uh, long story short, there was a sheriff sale in Philadelphia in 1848. And uh, the, the collection was split in mostly in half. Half of it was sold to P.T. Barnum, uh, who took the specimens to uh, New York City, to his American Museum in New York City. Uh, that museum burned down in 1865, uh, and apparently the fire started in the bird department. <laughs> uh, so that was all lost, and there was never an inventory of what was made, what, what he had from Peel's collection. Uh, the other half was sold to a gentleman named Moses Kimball, who took the specimens to Boston, and uh, he was associated with the Boston Society of Natural History, and they had a, a Boston museum at that time. Uh, the folks at, uh, folks at Boston Society of Natural History didn't quite realize the, the extraordinary treasure that had just come into their lap, and they thought that this was just old taxidermy, and they, uh, they gave it away, sold it to this taxidermist named Charles Maynard, who uh, took a lot, uh, basically William Brewster figured out that this had happened and quick tried to get the stuff back. But by the time they got it back, all the labels and any original mounts had been disassembled and taken off the birds. 
And the remnants of that collection, uh, they ended up in a barn in Massachusetts for about 20 years. And then eventually they were accessioned at Harvard at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And to this day, I've, I've looked at all the specimens. I've been through that whole collection um, and imaged them. And you'll be able to see photographs on the website for Ornithology and Peel's Museum that'll be launched later this year. Uh, only one specimen uh, had, or one, there's, it's a pair of specimens, the golden pheasants that George Washington gave to Peel. They still exist. And they are in Harvard's collection. And the only original label from Peel's Museum left is attached to these golden pheasants. And the label is made of wood. And it says, presented by General Washington. So. Now, when, one, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say, when I say that Philadelphia is the center of the bird world, I mean, where else could you be where someone in the audience would be able to give you that kind of an answer? Matthew Halley. So I just wanted to add one more thing about, um, about sort of data and specimens. So um, one of the modern tools that we have for this is that we image things and we also have databases. So our collection was actually the first bird collection ever databased in the country. Um, as a result of that, the early specimens that were databased don't have full data for them. So we actually have a project going and our collections assistant, Sam Hagler is here. She is actually working in the collection, trying to get all that data that's on those specimens back into the database, sort of repatriate the data from the tags into the database so that it's gonna be publicly available. And the other piece of this is that some specimens just were never databased. We don't know why. So we don't actually know exactly how many specimens we have in the collection. We know it's, it's you know, 215, 220,000 specimens, something like that. But the exact number is unclear because sometimes specimens aren't in the database for some reason. Maybe they were out on loan when the databasing was happening. Um, maybe they were in another case somewhere. Somehow they got by the people that were doing it. So anyhow, by doing things like that, we can we can make sure that we sort of protect this kind of information. Um, if, you know, I, ideally we don't want tags to come off of specimens, that's very hard to track, um, but it helps us sort of keep that data protected. You know, a specimen collection is like a library of information. It's just incredibly valuable. Um, any, of the, any of the great natural history collections are, are treasures really for the world of science. Hi, I uh, really enjoyed your talk and I look forward to reading your book. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is that at one point you described Audubon as a bit of a celebrity and th the men all seem to be very competitive with each other. And I was wondering, did they have notoriety outside of their own circles? Were people buying their books outside of the other people interested in this? Were they famous in any way? Well, actually, yeah, Audubon actually was something of a celebrity. Um, and, and, you know, maybe not so respected within scientific circles, but uh, he had become famous in England, came back to the States. Uh, when he traveled around, the, you know, the newspapers would write about the fact that he was in town. Uh, he could take rides on, on government ships to various places. And when he would go off on an expedition, like going to Labrador or something, uh, the newspapers would re write these, you know, breathless things about, Mr. Audubon has gone on another exploration. And, was so it yeah, just he kind of was a celebrity. Was it just him though, or did any of the other men achieve that? Maybe they were jealous of him. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of jealousy. Uh, no one, no one really in that era achieved that kind of fame. Uh, there have been, you know, there have been famous naturalists since, you know, David Attenborough, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> people like that. But, uh, he was the first. Yeah. All right, Ken, we live in a post Kingbird Highway world where the, you popularized a big year and you also popularized a big year book. Now there are dozens and dozens. So what would a 17 year old Ken Kaufman do now as a challenge? If I were, wow. Um, well, I wouldn't go hitchhiking around the country, uh, sleeping under bridges and eating cat food. Um, I. Uh, Probably not. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. The, you know, the times change. There are different opportunities. Um, I think, 
I have to admit, you know, I love birds, but if I were 17 now, I'd probably try to be more of a general naturalist and try to have like the, the biggest species count on iNaturalist or something like that. Um, you know, identifying, you know, c can I identify 20,000 species of beetles, you know? I mean, I would still like birds, but there's so much other stuff out there. And just, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't good field guides. So, yeah, I mean, there's, if you're interested in nature, you know, you can live for 10,000 years and you won't run out of new things to look at. That's just, you know, if you're interested in nature, there's no reason ever to be bored. And that, you know, when I try to get people interested in birds or in natural history, I feel like I'm doing them a favor. Like, this will make your life more exciting. So, yeah, I'm just deflecting and not answering your question, but thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, Mr. Kaufman. My name is Ethan, and your book inspired me as like a five-year-old to get interested in the natural world. And I don't want to ask the same exact question as him, but I am a 16-year-old and the same age that you were when you hitchhiked across the continent. But is there any advice that you would like to give to me as a 16-year-old? Yeah, there, there are always opportunities. And the opportunities may not be immediately obvious. I mean, if you've been birding for that long, then clearly you know a lot about the subject. And there are ways to use that knowledge. Um, uh, there, there are a lot more opportunities now. There's, for example, tour leading. Um, leading bird tours is something that wasn't really a possibility when I was in my late teens. But you know, if you're good with people um, and you like birding, that, that's a great opportunity. Um, there are all sorts of things for where a, a young birder can get involved in being an interpretive naturalist and teaching people. Um, if you if your interest takes a scientific um, bent, I would I would urge you to go to college and you know try to get a degree, uh, even an advanced degree in, in ornithology, uh, because you know as, as Jason was talking about, there's still these amazing frontiers out there with new things to uh, to discover. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's it's an exciting time to be a young bird expert. So. Um, you know, if you, uh, uh, if you want to talk later or, you know, write to me or something, we, we can share information about, about opportunities out there. I certainly so thank will. You. Thank you. Take a couple more questions. Hey, uh, Ken, I, I've always admired your artwork. I do think your work you know, rivals some of these, you know, folks like Audubon up there. I, I love seeing the field guides and an illustration like this is just really exciting to, to check out. Could you kind of give us a, a look into kind of your headspace as you approached trying to create a piece that, you know, kind of evokes what Audubon's artwork kind of, um, you know, presented to the world as a new way of, of drawing birds? How did you kind of set yourself up to emulate that yeah well thanks I um, it was a challenge for me because my recent paintings have been like oil paintings with lots of light and shadow and not much detail and so I spent a lot of time just going through Audubon's work and studying each thing and saying okay what can you say that they all have in common and you know, all the birds are viewed at eye level um, they're all done life-size they all have incredible detail there's not a whole lot of uh, light and shadow for, but there's, there's enough for a three-dimensional effect. Uh, things like plants um, in the foreground are done with, with great, great detail. There's, there's just as much attention to like a little bit of bark on a twig as there is to the feathers. And so yeah, I just, I tried to study and, and get into Audubon's head and I, I found that I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, I couldn't match his results, but it was really an interesting uh, experiment to try. So I, I felt like I, I gained respect for his artistic genius just by trying to do that. I have to say that, um, you know, some of your herons 
blow my mind. Like the, the Agami Heron painting, yeah. mind boggling. Yeah. So anyhow, they're, well, they're pretty you. spectacular paintings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Audubon would have said that wasn't detailed enough. You know, yeah, you couldn't see, the, painting, couldn't see the beautiful painting though. But thank yeah. you. Um, thank you so much, Ken, for a truly fascinating talk. Um, so I have two questions for you, both about um, Audubon's shady actions, because I never tire of talking about the topic. Um, number one, um, what is your personal view um, about um, Audubon's plagiarism of other artists' work, um, seeing as you yourself have basically worked very intimately with his art and his style? And number two, could you please tell us more about the stolen Harris's hawk? I have not heard that story before, and I think I need to. Okay, well, the, the, the plagiarism thing, in terms of Audubon copying uh, other artists, uh, within the, the context of the times, um, a lot of artists were doing that. They, they were, it was like you know, sampling other people's music today. So there was... Uh, you know, there's certainly cases where um, there are figures in one of Audubon's paintings that are copied from, um, like from Wilson. Um, the, uh, uh, his, his Bird of Washington was directly copied out of the Reese's Cyclopedia. And, but that kind of thing, I think, was considered somewhat more acceptable at that time. Well, no, no. I mean, and yeah, he'd said that these are drawn from nature, and in many cases they were not. Uh, they were you know, like drawn from someone else's book. Um, and as for the Harris's hawk, again, it's it's research by Matthew Halley that has shed more light on that. Um, the the Harris's hawk, uh, or what we call Harris's hawk now, had been sent to Philadelphia by a corresponding member of the Academy. Uh, who was out in Mississippi, um, and this this guy Jenkins sent the specimen with the idea that the bird would be described and named for Samuel Morton, uh, who was at the academy. But Audubon happened to be passing through, and it's um, it's uncertain whether he stole it or borrowed it, or maybe the academy had a subscription to his Birds of America, and maybe Morton gave him the specimen as partial payment. You know, it's, it's hard to say. But one way or another, the specimen that Jenkins had collected that he intended to name for Morton wound up over in England with Audubon. And uh, it was painted and, and named for Edward Harris instead. Um, and uh, again, uh, Matt Halley published about that. And it's, uh, it's worthwhile looking up the paper and reading about it. Just so many amazing things that these characters were doing in those days. It was, uh, you know, they they all they all had their foibles. They all, you know, copied or borrowed or stole uh, from others, and ultimately it all added to the total knowledge of natural history. But um, just just interesting times. They were better role models for their hard work and their curiosity than they were necessarily for their ethics. But, but again, you know, that was a different time and I don't, I don't intend to sit in judgment here on people who lived in a different era. Just, um, I'm grateful for the good work that they did and it's interesting to know about the other stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for spending your evening with us today and thank you, Jason, for moderating this debate. I'm going to pass it off to Marina to close out the evening for us. But before that, I just want to say that Ken will be signing books outside, right outside the auditorium. And there are books for sale available as well. Yeah. So um, Ken mentioned the way that Philadelphia distinguishes itself and also um, diversity of participation in birding happening now. And um, so one way we are currently distinguishing ourselves is through the championing of diversity in birding through our Black Birders Week celebrations. And a lot of the founders of Black Birders Week actually come from this area. So next, um, not this Saturday, but Jan um, June 1st, we will be hosting our third annual uh, Black Excellence in Birding Gala with a sneaker ball. And uh, uh, DVOC members are invited to join us and there's a special code for you to get a $10 discount off your 
tickets. So um, Christian Cooper will be our guest speaker, which is super exciting. So um, anyway, thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, it's just, uh, it was just amazing. And uh, thank you so much, Jason, for moderating. And you've been an amazing audience. So thank you all so much.